Welcome to the Concordia Publishing House podcast, where we consider everything in the light of Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm your host, Elizabeth Pittman. Hi, everyone. Grab your hymnals and get ready to dig into some Easter hymns with our guest, Peter Reske. Before we start our conversation with Peter Reske, I'd like to thank our friends at the LCMS Foundation for their support of the CPH podcast. If your congregation is interested in turning significant financial gifts into a long-term funding source that will bless the congregation for generations to come, the LCMS Foundation is here to help you. They were created to provide professional investment services to LCMS churches, schools, and RSOs. They've helped hundreds of organizations create, manage, and grow their endowments, and they're ready to help you. Learn more at lcmsfoundation.org slash podcast. Now again, grab your hymnal and let's chat with Peter Reske. Peter Reske, welcome back to the podcast. Hey, Elizabeth. Thanks for having me back. You know, the last time we did an episode on Easter hymns was in our first season of this podcast. So we're going back. Oh, golly. I don't. It might have been 22. It was, it's been a, almost two years. And that yeah. episode is still our number one downloaded episode of all of the podcast episodes that we've done. So our I'm listeners okay. really like hymns and music. I, I think they do like I hymns. Think they do. Yeah. I think they do. <laughs> and so, and I've lost count of how many times you've joined us here on the podcast. And it's always a good time. And so for our listeners today, we're here to do Easter hymns part two. And as is the norm when Peter comes on the podcast, I have no idea what hymns we're going to talk about and where we're going to go. So <laughs> let's grab your, <laughs> grab your hymnal. I've got my large print in here because my eyes are lousy. Um, grab your hymnal, grab a pencil, and Peter, tell us where we're going. Okay, so Easter hymns, part two. Um, today we're going to talk about three Easter hymns. And the first one... Um, is definitely an Easter hymn, but in LSB, it's not in the Easter section. You like pulling those little tricks out. I like switching them around. You do. Yeah. So the first one is, At the Lamb's High Feast We Sing. So we're going and to the Lord's Supper section? That's right, the Lord's Supper section. It's hymn number 633, At the Lamb's High Feast We Sing. So when we when we did the the first Easter hymns podcast, we we mentioned this one really, really briefly. Um, now's our chance to talk about it more in depth. All right. Um, it, it is definitely an Easter hymn. And in other hymnals or at previous times, it has showed up in the Easter section. But with Lutheran Service Book, we, we recognized that it was such a good hymn that should be sung more than just at Easter we made the kind of risky move to put it in the Lord's Supper section, knowing that week to week throughout the year, if you're looking for Lord's Supper hymns, you, sh you should definitely consider this one and hoping that people wouldn't forget it as an Easter hymn. And I, I don't think they have. Um, it's, it's a very popular hymn. Well, I think even in the worship planning books and things, it pops up as a recommended hymn at Easter time. I haven't looked closely at what's coming up here yeah. for, the, for this this round, but I would imagine it's in there as a recommendation. Yeah. Yep. All right. So tell us, so, give us the highlights and the unique nature of this hymn. Okay. So this is a very old hymn. It was originally written in Latin, probably sometime around the fifth century. Um, this, this, this is a, a very old hymn and we kind of need to understand the context um, in the early church, in the, in the first few centuries of the church, um, new, new members of the church, people coming, in, people coming into the church, would go through a period of, of catechesis, so a, a period of training and teaching that usually happened during Lent. And then at the Easter vigil, these, these catechumens, or almost like confirmands mm -hmm. today, would be um, would be baptized and then for the first time fully let into the part of the service with the service of the sacrament. So does that lend itself to the tradition that many congregations today tend to have that confirm not all obviously but that yeah. that confirmation time tends to happen 
during Lent or the first communion, I should say, maybe not as yeah. confirmation. Cause I know my son will be having his first communion on Monday, Thursday, you know, mine yeah. was on Monday, Thursday. So it, are the roots of that, do you think from think this tradition? So. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So in the early church, many of the, the new Christians were adults. Mm -hmm. Christianity hadn't spread around the world yet. Um, now many of, well, now, at, at, you know, at least, at least in the, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, most of our new Christians, most of them are babies. Mm -hmm. um, and that's good. And, you know, they're baptized, baptized as babies. Okay. But um, now when we look at um, First Communion or confirmation with First Communion, when that happens, um, traditions have it at various times in, in different parishes. So Monday Thursday is a really good one. Obvious connections mm -hmm. with the Lord's Supper there. Um, sometimes Palm Sunday is mm -hmm. one, um, but also uh, one that's becoming increasingly uh, common is at the Easter Vigil itself. So we we still have an Easter Vigil service, and um, the Easter Vigil service in Lutheran Service Book allows for baptisms and confirmations. And even if at your particular parish, you don't have any baptisms that weekend, um, they're still part of the service that includes the remembrance of baptism. Mm -hmm. So yeah, all of this, all of this goes, goes back um, to, to the early church. And um, some of the themes in this hymn absolutely reflect that practice. So let's, let's look at the hymn. Um, there are eight stanzas and we're going to think of it in two big chunks. Stanzas one through four and five through eight. It's conveniently laid out that way <laughs> in Lutheran service book. I think but, you did that on purpose. Uh, well, <laughs> I'd like to say that, but it, that that's just the, the, the way it, it broke down to fit on the page. But in our first four stanzas, we will talk about baptism and the Lord's Supper kind of alternating between stanzas. So stanzas one and three We'll talk about baptism in stances two and four, talk about the Lord's Supper. And then when we get into the second half, um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what those themes are about. So let's start right at the beginning. At the Lamb's high feast we sing, praise to our victorious King, who has washed us in the tide. Let's just stop right there. Mm -hmm. So if, if we see washed, we're going to think of baptism. Mm -hmm. Automatically, we think of baptism, and we should washed us in the tide, that is a large amount of water. Um, so we should also be thinking about the Passover and Israel's deliverance through the Red Sea. These, that Exodus 12 reading is also part of the Easter Vigil. Israel's deliverance, uh, well, yeah, Israel's deliverance through the Red Sea. And we should also be thinking of the Passover at Easter and Monday, Thursday. Um, so here we have washed us in the tide. We're thinking of baptism or washed us and tied a huge amount of water flowing from his pierced side. That's sometimes a little bit of a surprise. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, a reference to Good Friday um, that when the, the soldiers wanted to be sure that Jesus was dead and they pierced, pierced him and blood and water flowed out. We, the image here is the, that we are washed in that tide of water that flowed from his death. Mm -hmm. We are washed because of his death flowing from his pierced side. Alleluia. So the last, the last Easter podcast episode we did, we talked a lot about Alleluia and um, you get plenty of them, plenty of them um, in this hymn, one at the end of every stanza. And in fact, the Latin original didn't have Alleluia really? at the end of it. Yeah, did, did not have it, wasn't part of the poetry. And it is this particular hymn tune that allows for it. So this text, in translation, of course, paired with this tune, is a relatively modern thing. And that that Alleluia there on the end, the tune allows for it. 
And I think um, in our ears, it's just, it's almost like an inseparable part of mm-hmm. this hymn because the music doesn't stop before the Alleluia. And here's what I mean. Other hymns musically may kind of come to come to a cadence or, or come to a stopping point, and then you would have a refrain like an Alleluia or something. But here, it flows right into it, flowing from his pierced side, Alleluia. Um, and, and I think this pairing of this text with this tune is really genius. Yeah, it's a beautiful tune. It's one that you can't help but sing along. Yeah, yeah. Along. It's, yeah, you, you see the title of that hymn, and you're you're already thinking yeah. this tune. Yep. So in stanza two, we move to the Lord's Supper. Praise we him whose love divine gives his sacred blood for wine. This is not, um, it's not subtle. No. You know, it, it's, it's very clear. We know exactly what we're talking about. Gives his body for the feast, Christ the victim, Christ the priest. Alleluia. In stanza three... We move back to baptism, where the paschal blood is poured, death's dread angel sheathes the sword. So here we have the Passover, where the blood was marked on the, on the doorposts, the angel of death passed over those, those homes. And here, where the paschal blood is poured, again, huge amounts of liquid, Death's dread angel sheathes the sword. That's an image, isn't it? That it is. And Israel's hosts triumphant go through the wave that drowns the foe, crossing the Red Sea. And we think of our baptism again. Alleluia. Stanza four, we go back to the Lord's Supper. So in stanza three, we had the Paschal blood. And Paschal um, it's a Greek word that connects to, it means Passover, but now it also means Easter. So when we see it, it's meaning we should always be thinking Passover and Easter. So Paschal blood, the Passover blood in stanza three, now in stanza four, we know exactly whose blood that is. Praise we Christ whose blood was shed, Paschal victim Paschal bread. With sincerity and love, eat we manna from above. Alleluia. So now we have, we've come to the end of the first half of this hymn. We've had baptism, Lord's Supper, baptism, Lord's Supper. And we move now to um, more, probably slightly more familiar Easter themes. So right at the beginning of stanza five, Mighty victim from the sky. This is kind of a funny phrase, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mighty victim. I think often nowadays when we see the word victim or hear the word victim, um, it has has kind of bad connotations. Um, But in, in its Latin roots and more traditionally, a victim was the sacrifice. Mm -hmm something or someone who was sacrificed. And if you go back, consider how many times the word victim has already appeared in this hymn in those first four stanzas. But now we have here in stanza five, the mighty victim. So it's not, it's, 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 it's not someone um, where, where like outside forces totally acted on it out of its control or whatever. This is the mighty sacrifice. And our uppercase, our uppercase letters tells us Christ is the mighty victim, the, the mighty sacrifice. And it sounds um, it, it, it sounds a little bit like an oxymoron to our ears right now, but it's not. And in fact, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful image. Mighty victim from the sky, hell's fierce powers beneath you lie. You have conquered in the fight. You have brought us life and light. Alleluia. Brings us to stanza six. Now no more can death appall. Now no more the grave enthrall. Let's talk about that word enthrall. I think here's another word where in modern usage we think um, something enthralling, um, it, 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 it's not really a bad thing. Like we might say, 
oh yeah, she was telling, telling this story and we were just enthralled with her story. Like it was charming or, or we were spellbound by it or something like that. But in Thrall's original sense was some, like almost like put in bondage or enslaved. So the word captivate, to be made a captive, um, I, I think we, we do think of with enthrall, you know, like, like we said, that, that example, she's telling us a story and the listeners were captivated. But it really means like held in bondage by and so here, the grave no longer holds Christ in bondage, no longer holds us in bondage. It was more than just an easy rhyme for the translator with a Paul. Now no more the, can death appall, now no more the grave enthrall. You have opened paradise and your saints in you shall rise. Alleluia. Here's an important Easter thing. Resurrection. Not just Christ's resurrection, but our resurrection. Mm -hmm. um, East, if, if we don't also rise, um, it, it, you know, almost what is the point? Um, and then stanza seven. This one's really fun. This is... This is just Easter jubilation mm -hmm. out of control. Easter triumph, Easter joy. This alone can sin destroy. From sin's power, Lord, set us free. Newborn souls in you to be. Now let's think back to the Easter vigil. If we have catechumens who had just been baptized and just brought into the church, these are literally newborn, newborn souls. souls. Yeah, but we are also newborn souls in a sense. Every Easter, every Lord's Supper, we are like newborn souls. I think I think this is such a such a great stanza. And then we have stanza eight, the doxological stanza you would expect after, um, you know, after a hymn with with this much praise and rejoicing. Um, interestingly. This hymn did have a different doxological stanza originally, but not this one. So which one? The, the, the one we have came later. Are you going to yeah. tell us what the original was? Or oh, I don't, you don't know. I shouldn't have mentioned it because I don't know off the top of my <laughs> okay. head. Okay. Um, I thought you were setting up a, like you would, a teaser. No, no, no. So um, with, with many of these these early hymns, these early Latin hymns from the early church and into the Middle Ages, when we sing them now, many or most of them have final doxological stanzas, a final stanza with words of praise addressed to each person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But most of those got added much later. Most of those stanzas got added much later. So this one is interesting because it did have a doxological stanza originally. But for whatever reason, hymnal editors through the ages and probably in the 19th century, um, long before my time anyway, <laughs> um, they, they chose to use this doxological stanza instead. But it, it's, it's, it's a very fine one. And, you know, on, on Easter Sunday, um, you know, with, with all of the music and all of the rejoicing and all of the alleluias and everything, it's really great to have a stanza like this. Mm -hmm. Now, this is such a marvelous hymn. I mean, each verse... It's hard to pick a verse that is, I, I was trying to think about like, if I had to pick a favorite verse in this hymn, I couldn't because it's when you couple it with the tune and just how rousing it is. And it's so wonderful to sing on Easter morning when you have, if you're fortunate enough, the brass and, you know, the organ and everything in full force. It's, it's powerful stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It, it really is. And, and there's um, little phrases in there that I think are so memorable, mm -hmm. like Easter triumph, Easter joy. Right. Yeah. I like yeah. the, the light and life. You have brought us life and light. That's always, that one yeah. is another one that I like a lot. So it's, it's such a neat hymn. Yep. Okay. Okay. Should we move forward in time? You tell me. Yes. Okay. <laughs> it, it would be hard to move backward in time after that hymn. Let's go to Jesus Lives, The Victories Won. And this is hymn 490. In 
490. All right. Now we're officially in the Easter section, but this is a hymn that also often appears at funerals. Mm -hmm. It is definitely a favorite for funerals. And we could we can talk about that a little bit. But here we have Jesus Lives the Victories Won by Christian Fürchtegott Gellert. So he was German. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. <he was laughs> I'm, not, I'm not gonna try to pronounce that. I'll leave that to you. <laughs> um he was a professor of philosophy in Leipzig. And he wrote a lot of hymns and a lot of religious poetry, but ultimately very few of them have reached us today, at least in English translation. And in fact, this is his only hymn in Lutheran service book, but it's another Easter favorite and it's a funeral favorite. And here, uh, you know, we were talking about the tune with the previous hymn and how they work together. I think, I think we have another case here where the, where the tune, um, the tune and the text really go together and, and make a really, really great pair. And this tune writer is worth mentioning. This is, uh, the tune is by Johann Krieger, also German, lived, lived at the same time as Gellert. And whereas Gellert only has one text in LSB, Johann Krieger has many, many tunes in LSB because he wrote some of the best hymn tunes of this era. Um, I'm not going to list all of them that are in LSB, but some of them include the tunes for Soul Adorn Yourself with Gladness, Jesus Priceless Treasure, and Now Thank We All Our God. So there's some well-known hymns in there. Yeah, this guy's a pretty heavy hitter. Yep. Um, and, it, and I should say, back in the indexes of the hymnal, if people wanted to go find all of them, those trans, those yeah. hymn, they you could go to the back of the hymnal in the indexes and look up all of his hymns. That's right. Yep. You, you can see uh, all, all of Johann Krieger's contributions. Um, and especially with this tune, I think that the tune helps emphasize the framework of the poetry. And here's what I mean. If we look at every stanza, and if you have your hymnal in front of you, you it, it's really easy to see. Every stanza starts with, Jesus lives. All five stanzas, Jesus lives. And I'll just start by saying, that's an excellent place to start. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent place to start theologically. That's an excellent place to start poetically, musically. Jesus lives. And then every stanza ends almost exactly the same. This shall be my confidence four times. And then the last time, Jesus is my confidence. And the tune helps with this framework. The tune reaches its highest point in that last phrase, this shall be my confidence. Um, and, and Krieger wrote the tune for this text. No, no, no. That's not true. <laughs> okay. So remember last time we talked a little bit about tune names. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the bottom uh, in your hymnal at the bottom of the page over on the right, you'll see in real small capital letters, that's the name of the tune. And in this case, it's Jesus meiner Zuversicht, German for um, Jesus, my confidence. So you'd think, yeah, that's this text. This will be my confidence, the last line, Jesus is my confidence. No. Kruger wrote this tune for hymn 741, Jesus Christ, my sure defense. Okay. It's the same tune. Jesus lives, the victory's won, and Jesus Christ, my sure defense. Now, the funny thing is, the and the first line of that hymn in German is Jesus meine Zuversicht, which literally translates Jesus, my confidence. But in the English translation, we have it translated as Jesus Christ, my sure defense, mostly because um, we, we need to fit the number of English syllables to the sure. number of, of, of German syllables. So, um, no, this tune wasn't written for, um, for Gellert's text, but they were written at the same time. It, it goes together marvelous, marvelously. 
And in both hymns, we have this theme of Jesus being our confidence, our defense, all of those things. Okay. All right. Totally confused? Yeah. No, I, I, th I think I'm tracking with you. And I do like how, you know, at the end of each stanza, you're rolling off of this shall be my confidence and you're rolling right back into Jesus lives. So just, it is really neat how seamless that works. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. And I hadn't thought about that, but it's almost like this at the end of each stanza, this shall be my confidence colon. Yeah. And then the next stanza, yeah. Jesus lives. Yeah. I like that a lot. Yeah. So, um, this, this hymn talks about death. Um, and like I said, it's often used at funerals and Easter hymns often talk about death partly because, um, on good Friday, Jesus died and his resurrection on Easter is the ultimate conquering of death. Um, <clears throat> so in Easter hymns, we, we, we find other, other themes and, um, you know, other topics and keywords and things like that. But death is one of them. But the, one of the fun things about Easter hymns is that um, we don't have to fear death. Um, because of Christ's resurrection, we can laugh at death. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, like I said, it, it, Christ's, Christ's resurrection is the ultimate victory over death. And Christ's resurrection allows our bodily resurrection. Um, so let's look at stanza one. Jesus lives, the victories won. Um, that could be, that first line could be its own hymn. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, it says it all. It says yeah. everything. Jesus lives, the victories won. But it goes on. Death no longer can appall me. Jesus lives, death's reign is done. From the grave will Christ recall me. This is the important thing. And Gellert does this with his hymns. He makes them personal. Again, it's not enough that Christ rose. Christ also recalls us from the grave. Bright, brighter scenes will then commence. This shall be my confidence. We go to stanza two. Jesus lives, to him the throne high above all things is given. So in stanza one, we heard that death's reign is done. The th death's throne is now Christ's throne of life. We have this switch, this reversal. The throne high above all things is given. And then it's personal. I shall go where he is gone, live and reign with him in heaven. God is faithful, doubtings hence, this shall be my confidence. Which brings us to stanza three. And the question is, knowing this, knowing that Jesus rose, that Jesus lives, Jesus lives, Jesus lives, that he has conquered death, that he reigns the Lord of life, knowing this, how do I live? Jesus lives, for me he died. Now I will admit, in English, the, the middle of this stanza is, is kind of a tongue twister. The, the clauses and the commas and everything, but, he, but he, here's how it is. For me he died, hence will I, to Jesus living, pure in heart and act abide, praise to him and glory giving. So what does this mean? How, uh, how do we unpack this kind of grammatically? Because Jesus lives and because he died for me, I live to Jesus. And I live to Jesus by acting pure in heart. How? So how do we live? We live to Jesus, abiding and pure in heart. So how do, how do I do this? And I'll ask it as a Lutheran. I totally do it on my own. These are my works. These are my actions. No, of course not. Uh, Gellert tells us at the end of this stanza, all I need, God will dispense. It is only because of God and through God that, that my actions can, could, could bring, um, 
bring praise and glory to him, as, as the stanza says. Now in stanza four, um, we, we are reminded, I am reminded personally, that nothing, nothing can se separate me from Christ. Jesus lives, I know full well, nothing me from him shall sever. Neither death nor powers of hell part me now from Christ forever. God will be my sure defense. This shall be my confidence. And so if we've, let's say we've been like tracing the path of a life through this hymn, in stances three and four, we, you know, we're talking about how, how we are to live. And at stanza five, as many, as many uh, funeral hymns do, and as some Easter hymns do, now we need to face our own death. Um, until Christ returns, we will all die eventually. And so in stanza five, Jesus lives, and now is death, but the gate of life immortal. I think it's a beautiful image. It really is. To, to consider death as but a gate to life, and not just life, but life immortal. This shall calm my trembling breath when I pass its gloomy portal. Faith shall cry as fails each sense. Jesus is my confidence. So what we have here, we have a, a scene on, on a deathbed, mm -hmm. on your deathbed, on my deathbed. And when your breath is trembling, physically, physically, your body is dying. But also, it's scary. Mm -hmm. um, we say we have nothing to fear in death. That doesn't make not fearing it easy. Right. But this that Jesus lives shall calm my trembling breath. And then as each sense fails, as we can't see anymore, we can't hear anymore. Our faith cries out. Jesus is my confidence. I love this. My dad has used this illustration a lot in a sermon and he got it from someone else and I forget who got it from but he talks about as you get older and as you come to the end of your life you know your life narrows down and in the narrow place stands jesus and i just love how this this hymn just so encapsulates that idea of everything's falling away and it's getting narrower and narrower but then there in that narrow spot stands jesus yeah that's all you have mm -hmm. but all you need right yeah but also so um I have never been dying. I'm, I'm happy to report, I have never been dying. However, how many of us have sung this hymn at a funeral and so overcome with emotion and grief, mm -hmm. but also happiness and, and um, that we come to this, this stanza in this hymn and our breath is trembling. Mm -hmm. We can't sing. Right. Um, I, I, I think it has. I think it has impact there as well. It isn't just on the deathbed, but you know, like you were yeah. saying, throughout our lives, throughout our lives, our senses fail, and faith, mm -hmm. our, our, our faith right. comes to that focus right. on, on Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Another marvelous hymn. Another marvelous Another hymn. Marvelous there, there, yeah. There's... So the hardest, the hardest thing I had to do in preparing for this podcast was choosing which Easter hymns to talk about. Well, we'll do part three next year. It's all good. Okay. We'll, yeah. we'll get through all of them. <laughs> Easter happens every year. It right? does. <laughs> all right. Okay. Where are we going? So number three, the last one. Um, again, last time, the last episode where we talked about Easter hymns, I mentioned very briefly uh, an Easter hymn by Martin Luther. And I said, we weren't going to talk about it. There wouldn't be enough time. Well, we're going to talk about <laughs> it today. All right, let's do it. And that is 
Christ Jesus lay in death's strong bands. And it's hymn 458 in Lutheran service book. Now there's a, uh, so in addition, in addition to the fact that we didn't really talk about any Luther hymns last time, the other reason we definitely had to talk about a Luther hymn this year is this year is the 500th anniversary of the first Lutheran hymnals. Do you want to do a plug for the tour that you're leading? Can I do that? Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> so listen up, everybody. This is, this is big. This is good. In, in July of this year, so July of 2024, the last two weeks, um, Dr. Joseph Hurl from Concordia, Nebraska, Dr. John Veeker, who is the Dean of the Chapel at Concordia Seminary, St. Louis, and I, who were, the three of us were the general editors on the Lutheran Service Book Companion to the Hymns. This summer, we are leading a tour of Germany, Poland, and ending in Prague in the Czech Republic um, on the occasion of the 500th anniversary of the first Lutheran hymnals and, and some of these first Lutheran hymns. And the, the focus of this tour will be going to sites that are connected with Lutheran hymns and hymn writing. So we'll start in Berlin, and of course we'll go to sites connected with Paul Gerhardt, sites with Martin Luther, connected with Martin Luther, of course, but also um, J.S. Bach, um, Handel. We will go into Poland, um, this, this corner of Poland, um, at the time of the Reformation, um, had what was German speaking, and a lot of our Lutheran hymns come from this area. And then we'll end in Prague and and talk about some of the Slovak hymns and and Bohemian hymns and things like that. So, well, pretty cool, right? It is. It is really cool. And I'm going to be sending one of your um, one of, one of the folks that's going on the tour with a list of assignments to capture some footage. So you'll have some assignments while you're there. Okay, uh, excellent. I, which, which I look forward to it. To gather, it would be great to see the photos and some video come back from that. Um, so we'll be sending that that checklist of things. But we'll put a link, if, if it's all right, we'll put a link in the show notes. If anyone wants to learn more about the tour, they can go to that yeah. link and check it out. And um, at least as of, as of the time of recording, there are still some spots available if you want to join us. All right. So yeah, f follow that link and, and and learn more about it. It's it's going to be a, I think it's a once in a lifetime kind of. Kind it sounds kind of fabulous. Thing. It really does sound like a, a marvelous experience. So. Yeah. So yeah, if if you listen to these podcasts and you don't get tired of me talking about <laughs> hymns, then you should come on this tour. This is a, a tour for the true hymn nerds among us. That's right. So um, yeah. The first Lutheran hymnals came out in 1524, so 500 years ago. And this hymn, Christ Jesus Lay in Death Strong Bands, Luther wrote 500 years ago, first, first appeared in 1524. But before we talk about this hymn, we're going to flip one page forward in the hymnal and go to 459 and 460, because all three of these are connected. 458, 459, and 460. And we're going to start with 460, which is chronologically the oldest, and then go backwards to 459, move forward in time, and then 458. I'm okay. I've never, I don't know that I've ever seen these actually. Yeah. Sung. Okay. Yes. Okay. So 460, Christians to the Paschal Victim or its Latin name, Victimae Pascali. Um, we see the word victim there again um, in, the, in, in the Latin, uh, a very important Easter word. 460 was a medieval sequence. Now, a sequence was a, 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 a piece of chant that was sung between the epistle and the gospel. So now, we, now typically we'll sing like an Alleluia and verse or something else there. And um, at different times in different places, they, they may have sung different things between the epistle and the gospel. But this is where the sequence developed. And the sequence um, 
th this is a sequence for Easter and, and it's Latin text sung by choirs, um, chanted. Sequence text kind of grew and grew and grew and grew. And they became um, pretty popular. So popular, in fact, that by the 12th century, and now we're looking at number 459, Christ is arisen. By the 12th century, um, these medieval folk hymns in the common language had developed that were sung in connection with the Latin sequences. Okay, so let, 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 let me paint the picture. The choir would sing in Latin, Christians to the Paschal victim, offer your thankful praises. The lamb the sheep has ransomed, Christ who only is sinless, reconciling sinners to the Father, Death and life have contended in that combat stupendous. The prince of life who died reigns immortal. And then the people in the 12th century, so long before Luther's time, the people in the 12th century would sing in German, Christ is arisen from the grave's dark prison. So let our joy rise full and free. Christ our comfort true will be. Alleluia. And then they would alternate back and forth. So then the choir would sing the next part that begins, Speak Mary, declaring what you saw when wayfaring. And when they would finish their section, then the people would sing in German, um, stanza two of 459. Were Christ not arisen, then death were still our prison. Now with him to life restored, we praise the Father of our Lord. Alleluia. And then the choir would finish their part, Christ indeed from death is risen, etc. And then the, the people would sing, and let me say this one more time in German. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Now let our joy rise full and free. Christ our comfort true will be. Alleluia. So for centuries before Luther, there were in some places these medieval basically like folk hymns that had developed. They weren't, um, they weren't like the, like the, 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 the Latin poetry or, or even like we get later with, with Gellert in that previous hymn where he was a poet and wrote a lot of hymns and they were highly structured. They were kind of like religious folk songs, basically. So um, the themes aren't the most, refined the language isn't the most refined but but the people were singing them and in practice um, at least in this case on Easter they would sing back back and forth now 459 um, this kind of medieval folk hymn is called in German it's called a Liza or or plural is Lizen and that's because many of these ended, uh, many of these medieval folk hymns, like 459, the end of each stanza would have Kyrie eleison or Kyriolis, mm -hmm. kind of like compacting the, this word together. The, the Greek word or the Greek words that we still, we still know and use in our services, which means Lord have mercy. So many of these ended with, with, with this, this contraction of, of Lord have mercy, Kyrie eleis, that, this entire genre came to be called Lysa from Kyrie Lys, Lysa. Or sometimes they ended with Alleluia. Now, if you look, look through LSB, particularly at the hymns by Martin Luther, and again, you can go to the index, look up Luther's hymns, you will see many of them end with, each stanza ends with, Lord have mercy, or Alleluia, especially with the Easter hymns. These are cases where Luther either adapted an existing Liza, an existing medieval folk hymn, or wrote one in the style of that. Okay, so we had, we had the original Latin sequence, and then this medieval folk hymn developed from that to be sung with it, kind of interspersed with it. What Luther did... And now we flip back one page 
we're at 458. Luther took that German medieval folk hymn and greatly expanded it into his own hymn of seven stanzas. And we still have Alleluia at the end of, at the end of every stanza. Okay, so that is the origin of this particular Easter hymn of Luther's. Now, um, so we talked a bit about 2024 being the 500th anniversary of the first Lutheran hymnals. Let's talk very briefly about, about those hymnals. The very first Lutheran hymnal is nicknamed the Acht Liederbuch, which is German for eight hymn book. Okay. It had eight hymns in it. Yeah. So it, 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 it has its real official title, but it's, it's, it's nickname is the eight hymn book. And that came out very early in 1524. Um, only had eight hymns in it. Four of those hymns were by Luther. Um, but Christ Jesus lay in death's strong bands was not in there. Was not in that one. Uh, very shortly after that, in the city of Erfurt, which, we'll, which we will be visiting on our hymn tour, in the city of Erfurt, two rival printers released basically two versions of another new Lutheran hymnal. So this one you can kind of consider the second Lutheran hymnal, the Acht Liederbuch is first. And these, 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 these rival printers, um, it's, it, it, it's kind of, you know, kind of like a, like a sensational story. You know, there's a theory that one printer stole the plates from the other so he could get it out faster. And Oh, the drama. Um, oh, the drama. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, this uh, book, each of these is called an Enchiridion. So they, these are known as the two Erfurt Enchiridion. They, they come, came from Erfurt. And Christ Jesus lay in death's strong bands appeared in those books. So th again, this is really early in the year in 1524. Christ Jesus lay in death strong bands first appeared 500 years ago. This basically this Easter. That's pretty cool. That's absolutely cool. Yeah. And then one more important hymnal from 1524. Uh, this one was published in Wittenberg. And um, its musical editor was Johann Walter. And Johann Walter is known as the first cantor of the Lutheran church. So he worked with Luther. And in fact, um, on, on this collection, Luther wrote, Luther himself wrote the preface. So we don't know exactly how much Luther was involved with the Acht Liederbuch or the Erfurt books, but we know, we know that, that he was involved at least, at least enough to provide the preface for, for this book. And the interesting thing about this book by Johann Walter is it's not really a hymnal the way we think of a hymnal. So the Acht Liederbuch is, it's small, only eight hymns, and it has texts and some melodies, and the Erfurt, Erfurt books are like that as well. Johann Walter's book was for choirs. So already in 1524, we have the first music written specifically for Lutheran choirs. And Christ Jesus Lay in Death Strong Bands was in that one as well. Okay, now, um, we should probably talk about this Easter Prob hymn, right? Probably. Yeah, okay. The, dra the drama was a good sidebar though. Yeah, that's right. Death. Death, it, it, Death is a theme throughout this hymn, and it's right there in, in the first line. We start in the middle of the story. Christ Jesus lay in death's strong bands. There's no setup. There's no preamble. It's right there. Christ lay in death's strong bands for our offenses given. But then immediately it switches. Immediately. But now at God's right hand, he stands and brings us life from heaven. So it starts with Christ in death, strong bands. Now he brings us life from heaven. Therefore, let us joyful be and sing to God right thankfully loud songs of Alleluia. And then we do. Mm -hmm. Alleluia. 
in stanza two, um, Luther does something that is very typical for his hymns. In his hymns, he doesn't he doesn't just say um, something like, "God is really great. Let's praise him." He Luther's hymns proclaim, and this is a foundational and fundamental thing for Lutheran hymns. Hymns proclaim. They proclaim our need for a savior and that God saved us, how he saved us through his son. And so in stanza two, he's, he's laying out our need for a savior, our desperate need for a savior. No son of man could conquer death. Such ruin sin had wrought us. No innocence was found on earth. And therefore, death had brought us into bondage from of old and ever grew more strong and bold and held us as its captive. Enthralled, again, yeah. held us as its captive. And then in stanza three, the story continues. And there, I think there are thematic echoes here of Luther's great hymn, Dear Christians, one and all rejoice. There, Luther takes set, takes 10 stanzas to walk us through salvation's story. And he, he does something very similar. Where t- in, in Dear Christians, One and All Rejoice, God the Father says to the Son, it's time to have compassion. And then the hymn goes on and talks about how the Son came down and, and what his, sa- his saving works were. So the same kind of thing Luther does here in stanza three. Christ Jesus, God's own son, came down, his people to deliver. Destroying sin, he took the crown from death's pale brow forever. How is that for an image? Death's pale brow is sitting there, smug, wearing his crown and thinking, I just beat the son of God. I have him. And Jesus goes, takes that crown, takes it, takes it. Stripped of power, no more it reigns. An empty form alone remains. Its sting is lost forever. We talked earlier about how death, um, we need no longer fear death. Its power is gone, but its effects are still real. I think the, the phrasing here in this Luther hymn is really good. It's an empty form. An empty form remains. Its sting is lost forever. In stanza four, um, it was a strange and dreadful strife. Again, that's a that's a very memorable line for me. That one sticks sticks in my head. When life and death contended, the victory remained with life. The reign of death was ended. Holy Scripture plainly saith that death is swallowed up by death. Its sting is lost forever. Um, So um, here's a little tip. The word S-A-I-T-H is pronounced Seth. Um, If we, in English, and it's just a weird thing about English, S-A-Y is pronounced say, S-A-I-D is said. I don't know why. I don't know why it's not said, but it's said. And similarly, S-A-I-T-H is pronounced just like said. It's Seth. And you know it's got to be pronounced that way because it has to rhyme with <laughs> Yeah. Um, so here, Holy Scripture plainly says or said that death is swallowed up by death. Where does Holy Scripture plainly say that? Well, it's 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 54 to 57. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Alleluia. Alleluia. And just just a side note for our listeners who may not be aware, if you're looking in your Lutheran service book, and if you're ever curious about these phrases and and where they may come from, 
if you go down to the bottom right hand of the page, you will see the scripture references that you can go to and read read more about where the hymn writer pulled that language and that concept. That, that's right. Um, and yes, indeed, 1 Corinthians 15, 54 to 57 is down there. It certainly is. Now, um, this brings us to stanza five. Here, our true Paschal lamb we see. So we, we have the word Paschal again. And so we're, think, we're thinking of the Passover. We're thinking of the crossing of the Red Sea. We're thinking of um, Maundy Thursday. We're thinking of Christ's Passover from death to life. Here, our true Paschal lamb we see whom God so freely gave us. He died on the accursed tree so strong his love to save us. See his blood now marks our door. Faith points to it. Death passes o'er, and Satan cannot harm us. We, we, ha we have the, uh, the Passover again. Also, there's um, visual kinds of things happening here. So we have um, here our true Paschal Lamb we see. So with our eyes, we see the Paschal Lamb. And then later in this stanza, we see, behold, his blood now marks our door. Faith points to it. Faith points at it, and we look where faith points. Death passes o'er, and Satan cannot harm us. So what do we do? Stanza six. So let us keep the festival to which the Lord invites us. Christ is himself the joy of all, the sun that warms and lights us. Now his grace to us imparts eternal sunshine to our hearts. The night of sin is ended. It's, it's a wonderful image to think of sin as being a long, dark night. Well, and it, it trumps back in verse four, the strange and dreadful strife. So the darkness that we saw earlier in the hymn Yes. The sunshine has now come out and taken over. That, that's right. The sun has risen. The sun is risen. Um, the sun that warms and lights us and brings eternal sunshine to our hearts. So now we come to stanza seven. And um, again, we have a, a, a scripture reference here um, to 1 Corinthians 5. And I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and 8, and then we'll look at stanza 7. Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And stanza seven of the hymn. Then let us feast this Easter day on Christ, the bread of heaven. The word of grace has purged away the old and evil leaven. Christ alone our souls will feed. He is our meat and drink indeed. Faith lives upon no other. Um, I think sometimes this stanza can be a little confusing. Like talking about leaven... Um, Maybe some of us are too far removed from actually making our own bread. I personally have never made bread. Um, well, I have, so you're missing out. <laughs> well, <laughs> I get the fruits of, well, of people making bread. There you go. Homemade bread is delicious. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, like, t talking about the leaven and that, that kind of thing, I, I wonder if it is sometimes lost on people. However... What we have here, leaven, the old and evil leaven, sin, has been purged away by the word of grace. And so Christ, the bread of heaven, on Christ alone our souls will feed. And here, this hymn that talks so much about death, the very first line of this hymn in the first stanza, Christ lay in death's strong bands, and here, in the very last line, faith lives upon no other. Faith lives upon no other meat or drink. Faith lives 
lives upon no other person, no no other no other anything than Jesus Christ and and his resurrection. It's powerful stuff. And it's it's again we we've, we've talked about this before to when we're singing the hymns to actually take a minute and think about the words you're singing and think about the nuances because poetry is powerful and there's so much depth to these hymns and when you think about that context it's just you just become overwhelmed by the beauty of it all yeah yeah there, there is a so much going on in so many of these hymns um i think it's absolutely absolutely worth the time to um read them devotionally and study them and even practice them so that when we're singing them singing them um in the context of the service um those 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 little nuggets can 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 come out and um yeah it can, it can be part of that that complete hymn package well and i know we have a number of books and resources that help readers go deeper into the hymns and explain some of the context but you and your team are working on a new project that i think is really cool do you want to tease that one a little bit yes i do so we we have had um like you said we've had had many books that talk about the history of some of these uh, of these hymns, but this new book will provide um, some devotional background for every hymn in Lutheran service book. So, three thirty one all the way through to the to the very last hymn, um, and usually it's something. Um, it, usually, it's something kind of like what we were doing today. Mm -hmm. Where it looks at looks at the stanzas or parts of a stanza and pulls out important words, themes, connects it with scripture, and in other cases we may um, just just give an entire portion of scripture that that can be read, or maybe we'll provide prayers or something that like that that correspond thematically with the hymn. And this is absolutely designed for for personal devotion or family devotions, and. Um, you don't need to be a hymn specialist. Um, you don't even need even necessarily need to be able to sing the hymns. The way they will be laid out in the book is without the music. So you have the text and you can see the hymns, how the poetry is laid out, how the, the rhyme schemes work to emphasize certain things. And then you can really dig into those texts and the, and the connections to scripture. That's going to be such a neat, neat book when it comes out. I'm looking forward to that. And I think our listeners, many of our listeners will really benefit from that and enjoy it. So, yeah, Peter, thank you so much for taking us on this adventure through these Easter hymns. You, you promised us three, and I think we wound up with maybe six that we touched on. So <laughs> I think we, we, we got our we got our dose of Easter hymns in. And I'm, I'm glad that you were able to be with us today. Yep. It's always a pleasure. All right, listeners, we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Concordia Publishing House podcast. I pray that this time was valuable to your walk with Christ. We'd love to connect with listeners on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Concordia Pub. Visit cph.org for more resources to grow deeper in the gospel.